This is The Reality. Hello there. Welcome to The Reality. I'm Dudley Anderson. Really good to be with you once again, sharing the Word of God. Just to say that the reality is about lives touched and changed for the good, for good by the reality of knowing Jesus. If you've got a story to tell of the reality of Jesus in your life, I would love to hear from you. Write your story down and send it to me by email, dudley at surereality.net. The reality is produced by a listener-supported radio ministry called Sure Reality. Today on The Reality, we feature The Reality Bible Special. It's my pleasure today to share the show with Pastor Paul Pearson. Really good to have Paul with me in the studio. We're going to be talking about the intentionality of Jesus. Intentionality implies being deliberate or goal-directed, setting a purpose for something and just getting on and doing it, really. Jesus was intentional in his teaching and his ministry here on earth. He was intentional in his relationships and conversations with people. Today, Pastor Paul and I, on the Reality Bible Special, will be discussing the intentionality of Jesus in his conversation with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's Well in Samaria, the story found in John chapter 4. I began to just open up and see uh, a number of key things about the intentionality of Jesus. The intentionality of Jesus drives people to actually say, that's where I'm going, but on the journey, I'm going to be looking out for these signposts that you've given mm. me. I believe God's intention towards all mankind is to have a relationship with them and they can do mighty exploits. Mm. Reading the Bible is so important. I encourage you to read the Word of God and make it part of your life. It's my pleasure to have Pastor Paul Pearson today in the studio with me. Pastor Paul, we're going to be getting into the Word of God. As I always say, get into the Word of God and get the Word of God into you. Jesus said, if we remain in Him and His words remain in us, we will produce much fruit. We have to get God's Word to remain in us. And how do we do that? Well, we get into God's Word by getting our nose into it. That's <laughs> Keep absolutely your nose right. in the Word of God. Keep reading it. And once you finish reading it, read it again. You know, um, lots of people think they should read the Bible in a year. That's all very good. But, you know, you have the rest of your life to read the Bible, so read the Bible for the rest of your life. It's and quality, isn't it, not quantity? That's exactly right, and that's what we're going to be doing today. So today, we're going to be reading from John chapter 4. That's where Jesus uh, chats with that lady from Samaria at the well. And then we're going to be talking about the intentionality of Jesus. So to get going, let's read then from John chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left to Judea and departed again for Galilee. And as he passed through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from the journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This passage has, has, has really captured me over, over the last 12 months. It, very, most people jump to the living water bit, but God drew my attention to a number of things. And uh, as I began to read this, I, I saw um, the intentionality of Jesus to do something. Uh-huh. And that's a really powerful thing, I believe. Um, the, the scripture says that um, he he needed to uh, go to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. In my mind, I'm asking the question: Why did he need to go? To, why did he need to go through Samaria, knowing the interracial tensions between Jews and Samaritans? Mm-hmm. It says he needed to go through. Now that could have been that there was no other way. 
You know, he could have gone the right hand side of Galilee, or he could have gone the left hand side. <laughs> um, but he had to go. But he had an intention. And and then I began to to read very slowly the passage, <laughs> very slowly. And it says it came to a place called Sikar. Now, the, in the original, the, that word means the end. And I thought, ah, what is the end? Oh, right. What is the end? That that. Why why is why is why is this why has he gone to this place? Why couldn't he gone somewhere else? Mm. Why this place? And and so I began to just open up and see. Uh, a number of key things about the intentionality of Jesus. Number one, for me, the Jesus of the Bible cuts across racial tension mm-hmm. without any without any fear or favour. Him being a Jew uh, and and her being a, a Samaritan and a woman, you know, because we know the context of women in that time was was not great. Mm-hmm. But he cuts across the whole racial um, uh, divide. Uh, and he breaches something that the people of his day would have been really upset about, and that's one thing I love about Jesus. You know, I didn't, I don't think he went out to upset them, but he set a precedent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. My intention is that I'm going to reach people that the rest of you, you know, want to cast off. I'm going to reach people that are, you know, by the world standards, yeah. the outcasts. Very interesting. You know, yeah, yeah. you know, the outcasts, and we haven't even got to live in water yet. You yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> and and I saw that uh, 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 in what Jesus was doing, yeah. and um, he gets to to this place called Jacob's Well, and interwoven into the story, you see the woman's perspective and her perception that something natural was more important than what was in front of her, mm-hmm. and her eyes were blinded somewhat to what was in front of her. Mm-hmm. How often do we face that in 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 our, our, our daily lives when we look at the natural mm-hmm. rather than taking a step back? The intentionality of Jesus drives people to actually say, "That's where I'm going," but on the journey, I'm going to be looking out for these signposts that you've mm-hmm. given me. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. Wow. And, and 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 I just I'm captured with it. Yeah. And and I thought, oh, maybe this is just a one-off. You know, maybe I've had too much cheese. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> uh, and, and so what I did, I, I kept reading it again and again and again mm-hmm. and again. And I found that the more I read it, the more I began to see the heart of Christ um, for not only interracial, but um, women as well. Mm-hmm. You know, because we all know the debate, and it's a huge debate, and this is not the time for it. But you know, the role of women. Quite interestingly, I was I was talking to 120 um, Bible students in India. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I was uh, through a, a Zoom, and they did a question and answer with me. And uh, this one Indian lady, young student, stood up and she says, "What do you see the role of women has?" <laughs> in the church and I'm thinking well, oh my that, goodness it's really cross-cultural because oh, you know that's... Indian women have a different place in yeah. their society than, than you know it, it, European it, women yeah yeah it's almost this here and yeah. I'm going wow you know now be careful how you answer this for you and I said what does the scripture say mm. let's come back to the scripture let's come back to what the words of Jesus said and I quoted John 4 and I said he spoke to a, a woman who he shouldn't have spoken to yeah in the culture of his day. Mm -hmm. And I said, and then we come to the the passages in the Pauline epistles where, you know, Paul says, you know, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. And it's changing the concept of what what a lot of people know. Mm -hmm. And and I think intentionally God has placed this in the scripture for us to pull out, uh, not just the fact that he is the living water, but to pull out why God does things and and his intent. I believe God's intention towards all mankind is to have a relationship with them where they know their God and they can do mighty exploits. Mm-hmm. And I, I I'm I'm troubled somewhat in, in, in Western Christianity where I see um there's a lot of things where we're doing for Jesus, but Jesus is not involved in it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Very much, absolutely. 
becomes a process, becomes a production, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, I'm not just talking about the church production, but in, in my own life, my own living, yeah. I can live out my life rather for what I can produce rather than that relationship yeah. with Jesus. And, and you know, for going back to the story, I see Jesus building a relationship <laughs> yeah. cross culturally, yeah. you know, across the sexual barrier, male and female. Yep. Uh, and, and, and it's relational, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and, and I find it very interesting because it kind of bounces off the fact that um, Jesus had had this discussion with the Pharisees. Uh, and we know the Pharisees of his time uh, were pretty snooty uh, and self-righteous. And, and, you know, what they said really mattered in society. And they were rich and they would never have spoken to a woman mm-hmm. on their own. And certainly not a Samaritan woman. And yet right off the back of that, that's what I love about the Gospels. Very often we miss that, Paul. This is, you know, we, we're talking about getting into the Bible and, and looking, mm. reading the Scriptures. Very often when we read a Scripture, uh, we don't take it in its context, not just, you know, doctrinally, but um, in its its, uh, its chronological context, mm. in the storyline. true. You know, and it's so true. in the story, Jesus had been speaking to his Pharisee friends, and, uh, and they were grumbling, complaining about him. And, and so he intentionally, intentionally compares, compares that. John, as he's writing by the Holy Spirit, uh, writing the, the Gospel of John, is actually comparing the Pharisees to the Samaritans in the context of what's going on here. That's isn't it? good. And that, it's very yeah. interesting that Jesus then crosses that cultural barrier to build relationship yep. with a woman from another culture, which the Pharisees would never have done. And, and isn't that the, um, the message in the heart of the cross? is that we should be crossing those boundaries, mm. crossing those cultures, um, not um, taking our Bibles and beating people over the head with them, but showing them <laughs> the relationship mm. that is possible with a Heavenly Father um, that that will liberate, set free, and bring them into a place of, uh, of freedom. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And... My own particular take on this is is very often we we, we want to notch up some belt notches on our belts, mm. you know we get we get we see a decision and we've got a decision and that's it we, we we had ten decisions in church today, um, but that's not what we're called to do. Mm. We're not called to make decisions. What we're called to do is make disciples mm. relationship relationship absolutely absolutely build a relationship with people. Um, my wife and I were chatting uh, just over this weekend and uh, she said, well, how many disciples can you make? You know, and I said, if I'm honest, um, if you made three genuine, relational, emotional, spiritual disciples in your lifetime, you'd be doing well. <laughs> and then she said, she, she, she opened up with this, which relates to this. She said, well, Paul, how many did the apostle Paul make? Mm-hmm. So now my, my, my brain is going. <laughs> so I'm out. trying to figure yeah. this out. And I went, well, I know the first one, without a shadow of a doubt, was Timothy. Timothy, yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah. So the second one could have been John Mark in the latter stages of his, his, his yeah. ministry. And the third, tenuously, could have been Priscilla and Aquila, yeah, because they're the, all the others uh, people, all the other churches that he writes to. He writes to the saints, mm. not naming them at the beginning and and, and pouring out some affection. Mm. Um, maybe I need to do some more study into that <laughs> and to see if I can dig out some more. Mm. But discipleship is not a program. No, no. Yeah, you know, it, it's not something you read in a book and you follow and you you answer the twenty questions and. You're okay. You're a disciple. Mm. It's a life. How long have we known each other? Yeah, exactly, Paul. Yeah, we're good friends. Just for the record, we've yeah. been friends for a long time. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's discipleship. It is, and again, it's a relationship, isn't it? Yeah, I believe in in something that that's called r- relational accountability. Yeah, or relationship accountability. Yeah. I believe that we need to be accountable to our, our seniors and our superiors at work mm. in the government, um, and certainly within the church. I need to be accountable and in 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 submission to the oversight, the elders and the pastors, the deacons, whatever uh, the format of your eldership is in the church, the leadership of the church. But I believe that that relationship, that accountability, needs to be personal. It has to be a personal relationship. So I have, uh, for the record, again, you, you live 
fairly far from me, Paul. We don't yeah. see each other often. No. But um, if I have a situation in my life, because we're good friends, we have a relationship, yep. I will give you a call or send yep. you a message and say, hey, Paul, please pray into this. Please yeah. give me some advice. Uh, and, and so I'm submitting to you, yeah. but it's out of relationship. And it's not out of, out of duty, but it, it's out of relationship. It, it, it can never be an authoritarian thing where we are called to serve people because it's an authoritarian issue. I think what we see here is Jesus navigating uh, um, a tension and at the same time he has one intention in mind mm -hmm. and that is that this this woman uh, uh, this woman of Samaria will have an encounter that will change something absolutely Absolutely. Well, we're talking about the intentionality of Jesus today in the Reality Bible Special. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to The Reality, produced by Sure Reality, a listener-supported radio ministry. We depend on the generous gifts of our listener to produce this program. You can help reach millions of folks with the sure reality of the message of Jesus by becoming a Sure Reality Vision Partner partner with us, please visit the website surereality.net and click on Become a Vision Partner. Thank you for your company. This is The Reality with me, Dudley Anderson. If you've just joined us, I would love to hear from you. Perhaps you've got some questions or comments about what we've already been discussing on The Reality. Please send those questions to me by email, dudley at surereality.net, and we can have a chat. Well, today on The Reality, we're featuring The Reality Bible Special, Getting Into God's Word and Getting God's Word Into Us. We're looking at John chapter 4, the story of Jesus and his conversation with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's Well in Samaria. I have with me in the studio Pastor Paul Pearson. We've been discussing the intentionality of Jesus. Jesus had an intention to stop at that well and to talk to that woman. He intentionally sent his disciples down into the town to buy food so he could be alone with her to talk about the kingdom of God, to talk about living water and worship. We've been discussing that today in the Reality Bible special, The Intentionality of Jesus. Well, let's pick up our chat once again on the Reality Bible Special, discussing John chapter 4, Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob. Well, yes, indeed, it's wonderful to have my good friend, Pastor Paul Pearson, with me in the studio today for the Reality Bible Special. And, uh, Paul, we've been talking about the intentionality of Jesus to intentionally go through Samaria, to intentionally send his disciples, his mates, down into the city to get food, mm. uh, to sit down and have a conversation with this woman, a Samaritan woman. Um, now, I believe there's quite a difference between Jews and Samaritans. Uh, essentially, mm. they were Abrahamic. They all trace their heritage back to Abraham. I understand that the Samaritans were north of uh, Judea, mm -hmm. Judea being uh, Jerusalem in the area of the south of the time of Jesus. Um, and so Samaria was north of the south. In the old times, um, back in the Old Testament, there was a split mm -hmm. in Israel. And the north became Israel, and the south became Judah. Mm -hmm. And Judea, the province of Judea, uh, was the home of the Judeans, mm -hmm. or the, the people from Judah. And the north uh, was uh, where Israel was. So I'm understanding that the north became Samaria, mm -hmm. and the south obviously was Judea. What's the difference between them? I suppose the easiest way that I would you know, for, for, for our, our listeners to to explain that, is in some countries you have different dialects. Um, so in the UK we have a plethora of, of different dialects. Accents. <laughs> Accents, yeah, just, uh, <laughs> wow, just so, so different. But each one is a cultural-based uh, evolution of, of that area. And some Samaritans, you know, they decided that they were going to do some worship their style. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the Judeans in the South worshipping their style. And then we, we have this, the, uh, again, this tension build up uh, over time. And I, and I guess concepts as well, um, you're quite right in what you say. They, they are all from an Abrahamic line. Mm -hmm. And yet that got divided. And again, with with the intention to go through Samaria and at Sikar here, 
I think Jesus is showing us that um, despite our different ways of how we do things, the commonality is Christ. Mm -hmm. The commonality is Jesus. Now, the Samaritans, did. they they lived north of yep. Jerusalem, so they did not worship in Jerusalem. They lived, were worshipped on that mountain, Mount Gerizim, where, the, um, uh, where apparently um, Jacob gave Joseph a well. So that was their, their place of worship on that mount. The Jews worshipped in Jerusalem. But Jesus comes along and he says to her, Dear lady, um, a time is coming where you won't have to worship in a temple in Jerusalem or on this mountain by a well. Mm. You can worship wherever you are mm. because ultimately when Jesus died and rose again, we become believers in God. We receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit, who is God, mm -hmm. comes to take up residence literally mm -hmm. in our physical mm -hmm. bodies. Mm -hmm. Our bodies become, become the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I always say the true place of worship is wherever you are. That's a place of worship because you are the home or the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. This is really interesting. Um, verse 22 of John 4 says this, You worship what you do not know. Jesus is telling them that that's ignorant worship. Mm -hmm. Worship that's outside of any knowing at all. And then he goes on to say, uh, We know what we worship. Mm intellectual worship mm. and how much of our worship today is intellectual mm. and not heart mm. spirit and truth is what Jesus. but taught. the hour is coming mm -hmm. come on the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth mm. and that i think dudley sums up the intentionality of jesus to bring this to a climax mm. where our worship whether we're on a mountain whether we're in a cathedral, whether we're at home, whether we're on a train, we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So the worship should flow out of us. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Jesus is establishing the point that it doesn't matter who you are, what background you are, you're male, female, um, different dialect, different race. Mm -hmm. I'm cutting across those those divides mm -hmm. to allow to for you to see what true worship is mm -hmm. and just as a footnote true worship is not just singing song <laughs> you know <laughs> you know that as well as i do absolutely um and of course um jesus said worship in spirit and in truth it was it was uh, it was fairly prophetic what he was mm. telling this woman because up to that point they didn't worship in spirit and in truth so a time was coming in other mm. words it was prophetic in the future after his death and resurrection yeah. and that of course implying that we can become born again after his yeah. death and resurrection the spirit of god dwells within us as we receive jesus as lord and savior we become new creations by the holy spirit who lives within us we've just mm. said that mm. your body becomes the temple of the holy spirit now another reference to the holy spirit would be living water and that's a key yeah. verse in this portion we read verse 10 jesus answered her if you knew the gift of god and who it is that was saying to you give me a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water is he referring to the holy spirit i got stuck on this verse if you knew the gift of god stop mm -hmm. what is the gift of god and jesus tells us as we go through john's gospel i have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly yeah yeah, yeah. This is the Messiah. This is not Jacob. Mm. We're at Jacob's well, and she's focused on Jacob's well. Good point. This is the Messiah, the mm. one coming with a gift. And God wants to give all of us a gift so that we may have that relational experience that Jesus was talking about here. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit begins to flow through this woman. Mm -hmm. And he goes on even further into the, into the, into the chapter um, where she's so she has an experience that is profound mm -hmm. and goes and tells her whole town and they come out. Mm -hmm. They come out. I, I find that when we start to live intentionally with Jesus, when we start to live on purpose, when we start to live not because of a program, but because of our heart relationship with him, we are going to see mm. rivers flow out of us. Amen. I've Amen. wondered for years why, even in my own life, why I don't see more of the flow of the Holy Spirit. Could it possibly have been that I've not been living intentionally? Mm. Good point. 
out of that intentional living, that connection with Jesus, that that life giving flow of the Holy Spirit begins to work on people. And so, does it make everything go away? No. But suddenly we are we have hope that is like this bedrock, this mm. cast iron bedrock. Mm. No matter what happens, the power of the Holy Spirit bringing that not as an a, a gnosis word mm. but as a heart rhema word mm. Amen. Oh, i've got that Amen. that's the gift of god who was standing in front Praise of her god. absolutely mm. and i think that you know I, my, my prayer is that everybody experiences this flow this gift mm. the gift of jesus christ uh, as a savior but it doesn't stop there he empowers us through the holy spirit mm. to live for him mm. and you know when we start to live intentionally uh, amazing things begin amazing to happen. happen. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it could be somebody's listening up today and uh, they think that God doesn't uh, worry about them or is not conscious of them. Well, let's just put that right. God has an intention for you, my friend. God intends to touch your life. He intends to save you. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, turn to him today and say, Lord, I receive your intention to save me. I give my life to you in Jesus' name. Paul, pray for us in closing. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of Scripture. I thank you for the gift of God that has been deposited in both Dudley's and my heart. And we pray that whoever's listening to this, they may know that gift who is standing in front of them, who wants to give them life. May the power of the Holy Spirit just come upon every listener Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pastor Paul, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. You've been listening to The Reality, today featuring The Reality Bible Special, getting into the Word of God and allowing God's Word to permeate our lives. Sharing today's program with Pastor Paul Pearson and our big thanks to Paul for sharing those incredible words. Maybe you've got some questions, perhaps something that we've spoken about today has, you know, just struck a chord in your heart and you'd like to talk about it. I would love to receive an email from you. Write to me, Dudley at surereality.net. I would love to hear from you. Indeed, to enter into this relationship with God, we need to intentionally surrender our lives to Christ. Perhaps you've heard enough to know that Jesus died for you and rose again from the dead and thereby making a way for you and me to come into right relationship with God by having our sins removed by faith through His grace. My encouragement to you today, therefore, is to intentionally give your life to Jesus. Once again, if you'd like to know more about that, write me an email. I'd love to chat with you. It's dudley at surereality.net. Well, the Reality is produced by Sure Reality, a listener-supported radio ministry. With your prayer and financial support, we can produce these programs, changing lives for the good, for good. If you would like to partner with us, please visit our website, surereality.net. Click on the menu option, Become a Vision Partner, to join this ministry. From me, Dudley Anderson, to you, keep walking in the reality of Christ. <laughs>